Welcome to Walking with the Savior podcast. I'm your host, John Kirkman, and I'm here today with a special friend, my good buddy, Matt Gardner. When I first met Matt, it was obvious of his discipleship, but as I got to know him more and on occasion hear his story and his background, I soon learned that his discipleship wasn't always right. In his teenage years, he had some rough roads and some rough paths to travel, and so today he's come on to share his story of how he went from some rough times to being a pretty faithful disciple of Jesus Christ today that I really look up to and admire. So Matt, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you like to do. Well, first off, thanks, John, for having me. I am so glad to be with you to talk. Yeah, so I, so currently right now what I'm doing, I teach ninth graders all the way up through 12th grade at high school. I do that full time. And my evenings are basically going to school. I'm working on a PhD right now in biblical studies, and I have a great love for just learning all things about religion and especially Jesus Christ. And so that's where a lot of my free time is actually spent is just studying and writing and researching. And outside that, I have three little kiddos right now, ranging from seven to four and to one years old. So I spend most of my free time playing with him, and we love to watch sports. I'm a big uh, sports person. I think you'll get to know that from this podcast. I love basketball, and I love football. Awesome. So, Matt, jump in with your uh, early upbringing and your teenage years. Where did you start? Where were you at in your teenage years? Go ahead and tell us a little bit about your story. You bet. So I actually grew up, so currently I live in Utah, and I grew up actually in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm the last of seven kids. I would definitely say in my household growing up, religion, sports, and politics were just, that was our main conversations. And so I I grew up in a household where these sorts of topics were free to discuss. And and so I spent a lot of my time in my early youth playing basketball. I thought, truthfully, I thought I was going to make it to the NBA, John. And that was like a big goal of mine, believe it or not. Um, Of course. Back in the 90s, man, and I'm sure you can relate to this, it was all about Michael Jordan. Amen. And, And I remember being so enamored by Michael Jordan that I literally thought, look, this is what I'm going to do with my life. And, and so that, that kind of was going on in my life, a lot of basketball and truthfully sports was a good outlet for me. But if I'm being completely honest, it, it was sort of, it kind of confused my identity, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I think I, I was always intuitively, um, I don't know how to describe it, but I I always loved God, but I think it got overshadowed with the sports. And then the lifestyle of sports, I think I was more obsessed with the idea of sports of being a basketball player than actual playing. I liked the look. Another player that I loved so much was Allen Iverson Mm. with the cornrows yeah, and that kind of lifestyle, which I loved. And So yeah, that's what I really was into growing up was Michael Jordan, Allen Iverson, and Deion Sanders. I think those three guys had a big uh, influence on me. I think they had a lot of influence on a lot of American young men at that time. So I can relate. Where did uh, your teenage years head after basketball and stuff fizzled out? Where were you at with uh, at this point in your life? Yeah. There was a pivotal moment in my life. It was my eighth grade year, going into my eighth grade year. I started, you know, I wasn't making the best decisions at school. I was a little bit, I was not really into school with education. I was more into how I looked at school and how many friends I had. And that kind of took me down some pretty interesting paths. And I remember getting disciplined quite a bit. I was being sent home because of discipline issues. 
And so there are two moments. One moment came when my mom, I still remember this. She came to pick me up and she just looked at me when we were walking out. And this, this kind of started the change in me. She said, hey, your, your grandfather has worked so hard to build your last name. Uh, and you're sort of tearing it down. And uh, that was some pretty uh, frank words on, on my mom's side. And that sort of hit me. Didn't fully like change me, but that, that stayed with me. And then the other moment was my dad, we had dinner with my grandparents. It was actually my grandmother at this time. And uh, my grandfather had passed away. I've always looked up to my grandfather. He played sports. He played for Utah State. The reason why we went to Colorado to begin with was because my grandfather actually played professional basketball there for, this is pre-NBA days. <laughs> but any, anyways, my dad just said, we were coming home and he said, what do you think about moving to Utah? And that did, that did not go over well with me. I did not want to go to Utah. Um, I liked where I was at. And uh, that summer... Um, uh, just me and my dad packed up and we moved over here to Utah. And, um, it, that first year was really rough where I, 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 within three weeks at school, I was already kicked out. Whoa. And uh, what was the genesis for the move? Me primarily. So you were getting in so much trouble. Yeah, I was getting in trouble on the side and I should maybe clarify about that. My issues were never dealing with drug addiction or anything like that. Mine was a behavioral issue. I just had a hard time listening to authority. I didn't like it. Mm. So I tended just to push away. Not sure why. It was just my temperament at that age. And so, yeah, from that event, from getting kicked out of school, truthfully, what happened was I was I was on the basketball team. I made the basketball team for my middle school, and the team decided to shave their heads. And I have some pretty big ears, and uh, and I shaved my hair and didn't like it. So I put on a, a New York baseball cap, and it was a no it was a no hat school. Oh, wow. and that didn't go over very well. So the, I actually went to juvenile detention and and that was the moment where I started getting help. And I think this was the first time where I sincerely got on my knees and just pray to the Lord. Like I said, I think I've always had a relationship with the Savior, but it was just buried. Hold on a sec. I got to back up. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are you saying you went to detention center because you wore a ball cap? Because that's how it seemed to appear. Yeah, so that, and I fought back. I resisted. And yeah, that I think it was their way of trying. And I look at, I don't blame any of my teachers or sure. parents. I think it was, they saw that I was crying for help. Mm. And I just didn't know how to ask for help. Was this Colorado? This is in Utah. This is in Utah. So within three yeah, weeks of first being... year. Yeah, three weeks. So I got kicked out of Centennial Middle School by BYU. And then I actually went to Fair Middle School. And that and so at Fair, I got into it with a teacher. And then at Fair, they actually sent me to Fair uh, after the whole Centennial debacle of just my attitude with teachers. And then they wow. put me to Fair. And that's where I had the incident with the ball cap. And again, I don't think their motives was to be mean to me. I truly look at them as, hey, this kid needs help. Mm. And thankfully, I actually didn't stay in juvenile detention for very long. And I got some professional counseling uh, for about a year. And I will just say that moment, though, in being in DT, it humbled me. Mm -hmm. And I, it was one of those moments where you had to be, I had to, to be compelled to be humbled. And that's where I started to find the savior in my life. Uh, was it in DT when you had this prayer that you were hinting at, or you just started talking about 
a few minutes ago and then I interrupted you. Was that where this prayer began? Was in DT or yeah, in D- yep, in DT. Roughly how in long fact, into your trip at DT? So well, I'll tell you what I <laughs> there were when I was there, I couldn't sleep. Mm. I was so distraught. Mm-hmm. And my recollection was I hadn't been in sleep for 48 hours. Oh, wow. And I was in, I was in, I was in rough shape emotionally. And like I said, I remember getting on, on my knees and just calling out to God. And <clears throat> at the moment, I didn't even really realize what happened. Mm. Uh, I finally just fell asleep, to be honest with you. Mm. And I did have a dream. I actually dreamt about my grandparents and what they represented. Because like I said, I always um, adored and valued my grandparents. Uh, they just always had so much confidence in me and what they represented. What they represented was the Savior to me. Mm. And I wanted to shape up. And so that's that's kind of the genesis, the beginning of it all. And it wasn't easy like after it was life was still hard, but it was a new beginning. What was the next step in your journey? How long were you in DT? Uh, Probably truthfully, probably a a month. Okay. Probably there for a month. And then I had to go through the whole court circuit and thankfully the judge Again, I see this judge, and I can't remember the judge's name, but she had so much mercy on me. Hmm. She got me. She says he doesn't belong in there. He just he needs therapy hmm. and lots of love. Hmm. And and my parents were that to me. My parents were always amazing to me. My older siblings, my seven siblings, were always good to me. And I just needed it for myself. So after that, I should say, John, I I went on to. I actually did not graduate from high school, but the goal for me in high school was just to mind my P's and Q's and not get in trouble. The education side came after after high school. So yeah, there there was definitely a few pivot points in my life. DT, high school, I kind of got myself together behavioral wise. And I had some learning disabilities along the way too, specifically with math and that's what prevented me from graduating from high school. And there were moments, and I tell my students this, that I teach, where there was days where I just didn't want to go to school because it was so painful to go to class and look around and everyone seems to be getting it except for yourself. And so where I found my value was, again, through friendships and meeting new people, hanging out with friends, and I just sort of ignored education. It's so hard to believe where you're at, that you're enrolled now in a a very difficult PhD program. That's remarkable, Matt. What's the next key pivotal point in your spiritual journey to discipleship? So, so yeah, during that time, like I said, meeting a lot of really good people, Mm. a lot of good friends, they had a big impact on me. So many people at for the positive. And even though I didn't graduate, I still went on ahead to f- put in my missionary papers. And so I did that thinking, um, you know, just because I didn't graduate from high school. And I don't know. I, frankly, I can't fully remember. I, I, I think I had the impression. I was like, I don't know if they'll let me go on a mission because I didn't graduate from high school. But one way or the other, I got called and I was called to the New York Rochester mission. And, you know, I look back on my life and I try to give advice to my students. There was some things where I just felt completely uncomfortable sharing like emotional things. I tried to act like everything was fine. And emotionally, there was still some growth that I needed. And when I went on my mission, I had a really successful mission in terms of teaching. It's a two-year mission. And by that six-month mark, I hit a wall emotionally. And I think at the time, I didn't know what it was, to be honest with you, because I never experienced this kind of depression before. And I would call it separation anxiety Mm. from family and friends. Wow. 
And I was doing so well where I felt like I didn't, I felt like guilty if I told my mission president that, hey, we're doing so good teaching and and helping others to come unto Christ. And I felt like I had it, I needed to be strong. And so I kept it within. And uh, <laughs> the story goes where I just got overwhelmed. I didn't ask for help. And before you know, it, it was too much where before you know it, I had to come back home. And that, that was a traumatic moment in my life because I did not want to come home. But thankfully, my church pastors thought it was the best thing to do. So I, I came home and... Can I, can I jump, pause just for yeah, a minute? And you bet. Just, so you're six months out on your mission and you hit this wall. What were you feeling? Kind of give us an idea of what you're going through that made it so your leaders felt like you needed to go home. I think, like I said, it was, it, I, I kept feeling so anxious away from my family and friends. And I think this is a common issue still today. And so I just, I, I remember just feeling abandoned in lots of ways. Not that anyone was treating me wrong or it, it just, that's how I felt. And, and, uh, the true story was I actually left the mission. Oh. Yeah. To my, one of my best friends who lived in New York city. And I went down there and my parents called my parents when I got there. And then that's when my pastors called and they're like, man, we love you so much. Like it's probably best for you to get the help that you need. Yeah. And so I did. And I went home and my pastors were amazing. Um, and, um, I was embarrassed and I, and again, like I wanted to stay out there, but I did not know, I did not have the emotional fortitude or the maturity to handle those kinds of emotions. Mm. And one of the big reasons too, and I think other people may experience this who go on missions, having crushes. And I had a crush, I had a high school crush mm. that I really admired this young woman and when it's not reciprocal, that that's always hard on a 19 year old. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to work through that and I needed to learn how to love myself. So, yeah. Yeah. I feel you when you're young and you feel like you're in love and it's not reciprocated or maybe they dump you or whatever. It hurts big time. It, even as an adult, right? But it's emotions yeah. that are really difficult for young teenagers to process and to feel like absolutely, still, and to feel like there's still hope that no, it's not the end of the world. No, it's not the only person that will ever love you. Love. So, yeah, and that's hard. I was just gonna really quick, John. I, I think despite that failure, again, most of my success in later life has been because of these failures of mm. tasting the sadness, the pain. Mm. And I had, to I had to make a decision in my life at that point. I think it would have been, it would have been very easy for me to have uh, stopped believing in God and in attending church. But I, and I'm thankful that one of my brothers reached out to me and I think the real pivot in this story was, I guess, the redemption. I don't know why my brother thought this about me, but I, he said, he just came out and said, hey, I think you might like Neil A. Maxwell. Have you tried reading his writings? So I gave it a shot and I started reading. I consumed all of his work. It just spoke to me. His way of language and describing and talking about the Savior and his love and mercy. And with that, of learning about the Savior, particularly his sacrifice, I needed to learn how to sacrifice some things in my life, uh, specifically to trust God that my future is still bright. Mm. But I needed to learn that he was in control, not me. 
And uh, through that process of just, I bought all 30 of his books, (laughs) consumed them, and it changed my life. And then that's what got me out of that emotional darkness. And then, so I felt... What what does Maxwell write about? What, what, What were these books about? So Neil A. Maxwell spoke a lot about Jesus Christ, specifically his atonement and sacrifice, and about discipleship. Okay. And one of the quotes that really touched my heart was this quote, the submission of one's will is really the only uniquely personal thing we have to place on God's altar. The many other things we give are actually the things he has already given or loaned to us. And I think that quote for me basically told me that I need to allow God to mold my desires. Mm. And that that was the change. And I felt like a new person when I started doing that. I wasn't as depressed and sad and worried about the future. And I'll forever be grateful for Maxwell. And then that, that, that sort of bled into sort of now where I am today. I went on my mission in 2002, but since then I've been on a pretty rigorous academic journey, journey since. It sounds like you recognize this need for greater discipleship, trusting, but there's this trust element, trusting Jesus. And as you faced your future after a mission that didn't end, frankly, the way you or most of us wanted to. Right. What did you learn about trusting the Savior that allowed you to cope, that allowed you to re-grasp, hey, there's a future for me? That's a good question. I think with reading Maxwell's words, what came with it? was the Holy Ghost. It was really the Holy Ghost that held me up where I felt a sense of comfort that Jesus Christ himself told his disciples that he would come and comfort them with. That, from from my own personal life, I felt that. I don't know if that gets at your question, but certainly it was that inner voice from within of, hey man, you're good, brother. Keep going. Keep going. It's no joke. The Holy Ghost. True story. Where I first attended Centennial, where I first got kicked out of school, they had a a school for those who did not graduate on time Mm -hmm. or had just life issues come up. And I walked by that school and I felt the Holy Ghost prompt me to say, you need to go and check in that school and see what it's about. And I walked in there. That was not me thinking. It was a total impression. Didn't even know that school really existed. And I call that divine design. And that was the other thing that Maxwell talked about was divine design. So when was this? So this was, let's see. After high school? Yeah, this was after I came home from my mission. This was like 2004. Okay. And um, I went in there and I said, hey, will you guys accept me? And primarily that school, it was, it was, I felt like 90% of it were young women who were pregnant and had to drop out of high school. And so they were getting their degrees and I asked if I could join them. And I sat in on those classes, started working on my math and just hoped and prayed that the Lord would help me carry me through this time of trying to figure out math. And I got through it. And then slowly from there, again, I felt like the Holy Ghost was constantly leading me to new things. After from there, I thought, you know what? I'm good. Now I can just go to work doing real estate like my dad did. But that wasn't what the plan was. I kept feeling what I would describe as the Holy Ghost saying, you need to go back, go to college. And I had, I teased at that. I was like, me go to college? There's no way. Mm. And I felt that, that voice from within saying, go take the bet, the class that you feel like you would have the most success at. And I knew I, I was a pretty good writer. And so I took an English class, passed it. 
and added more and more. And at that time, I was working full time with my brother in law, who was contracted by the church to paint temples. So I painted through the day, and then I would go to school part time. And then in 2010, that's where I met my wife. Matt, as you look back, what have you learned about your journey about Jesus Christ? Well, I was just reading Isaiah, and maybe this kind of encapsulates how I feel, how I felt the Savior has helped me in my journey. Um, This comes from Isaiah 49, and he says, For can a woman forget her suckling child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Mm. I think that encapsulates what I've learned from the Savior, that he has paved the way for me. And I, what I've learned in my faith journey, life journey, is to rely on, on his love. And when I focus on him, My doubts, my emotional worries, they don't fully disappear, but I learn how to navigate them in a way that I can come off successful. And I have been. And I would never say it's me. I'm not the smartest person, but I feel like the Savior's infused me with grit. I don't stop. I just keep going. Kind of a song that's coming to my mind right now is called Never Too Far Gone by Jordan Felice. You ever heard of that one? No. So it's a Christian song, and it goes like this. I've loved you from the start. I've seen your hurting heart, and you feel so lonely, but you keep on hiding because you feel so guilty for what you've done. But there's no distance too far that I can't reach you. There's no place that's so dark that I can't find you. Anywhere that you are, if you need proof, take a look at these scars and know I love you. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what you've done. You are never, you are never, never too far gone. Beautiful. Love it. If somebody's out there in the mix of the mire, the mud, and they're just struggling with finding hope in the journey, and maybe they feel like they've messed up too many times or struggling with some things like that, what what would your message be for them today, Matt? I think for Anyone who is in that darkness, my experience was getting on your knees and praying to your maker. People could rationalize that away, but for me, just from a practical standpoint in my life, it's helped tremendously. I would say in addition to prayer, it's really reflecting on that inner voice. I feel like that inner voice, it's not unique to me. I think just from a theological perspective, I think we all have that inner voice, that light of Christ in us. And uh, sometimes we just got to tune out the world, the distractions, and to focus on that, that still small voice. And uh, it's a powerful voice. It's a motivating voice. And I would say, keep your ears attuned to that voice from within to do good and to be kind to yourself and to not demean yourself. It's so easy when you start feeling that darkness of depression to um, just to beat yourself up emotionally. And for me, it's that still small voice that keeps me above it. And I would suggest others trying it and really meditating, whatever that is, prayer, meditation, music, going on walks, being with family, things like that. Matt, it's incredible to look at where you are today and where you come from. You're an incredible scholar today. You're getting a PhD in Bible studies. I've heard you present and you're phenomenal, very insightful, very educated. And it's crazy to think how far you've come from a high school dropout who had 
learning disabilities or challenges, whatever you want to call them. It's just phenomenal to see where you're at today. I appreciate that, John. Um, Truthfully, it's not me. And I really mean this. When we go to the Lord and we give him our desires, our all, he makes our desires or even our weaknesses really become strengths. And it's all the Savior. It's the Savior's doing, not mine. I want to thank you so much for coming on and joining this episode of Walking with the Savior and witnessing that as we turn our lives over to the Savior, He can lead us to bigger and better places than we ever imagined. Like, I I doubt when you were 17 years old or even after your mission and you're thinking about going back to high school and getting your degree, that you could see yourself getting a PhD. (laughs) Yeah. The Lord has a sense of humor. Thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. What a tremendous journey you've been on. I really appreciate you coming on and being vulnerable, being real with us, and sharing your story. You bet. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Walking with the Savior. Please share this episode with a friend if you liked it. Leave us a review. You can find new episodes each Sunday. Quick shout out to Gabriel Heaton, who provided the artwork for this show. You can find him on Etsy. I'll leave a link to his work in the show notes, as well as a link to Jordan Felice's song that we referenced. Thank everybody for joining us and encourage everybody to have a great week. And most of all, enjoy your walk with the Savior. Have a great day, everybody.